I'll just re-say that again. This is one of the many amazing events as part of the Scottish Geology Festival. Um, there are, oh, I lose track of how many events, well over 100 events all over the, the country. Everything from conversations about books, which is what we will do now, to uh, pebble events at the beach, to uh, tours, to museum exhibitions. It's been amazing. Um, but anyway, enough babbling from me. What I would like to do now is introduce, well, briefly I'll introduce who I am. I'm one of the trustees of the Scottish Geology Trust, Elsa Pancharoli. I'm also a, a paleontologist from uh, the Highlands, although I'm currently in uh, deepest, darkest Oxford, remote Oxford. Um, and I'm here to introduce the author of this fantastic prize-winning book, uh, Frank Rennie. Uh, now, Frank, I'm going to embarrass you for a little second by doing a wee introduction. So um, I actually met Frank a few years ago when I was a student at the University of the Highlands and Islands, although we didn't get to chat much at the time, but I was well aware of, uh, of his work. He uh, is a professor of sustainable rural development at Lewes Castle College um, on the Isle of Lewis and an extremely excellent um, uh, teacher and prolific writer, having written more than 30 books in Gaelic and English. And he's a natural scientist who has strong roots in landscape and community and a real passion for communicating science in everyday language, um, you know, to, to just the normal folk, uh, none of this scientific mumbo jumbo. Um, and that is exactly my kind of person. And that's why I really wanted to chat to him today about his amazing book. So Frank, uh, hello. Hello there, it's a real pleasure. Oh, it's a really, really nice. I'm so glad that you could uh, join us for this event. I mean, first of all, I should say it's probably obvious from, from what I've just said, but I'm a massive fan of your book. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure many people here have, have read it and those who haven't, I highly recommend picking it up. It's uh, published by Acker, is that right? That's right. Yeah, um, so I guess, first thing I should do is rather than me wittering on is ask you um, yeah. if you met someone who knew nothing about your book oh, for the first time honest. how would you summarize the book what's it about? The book is about uh, this village my village um, I live in the northwest corner of the most northwest of the island um, right on the top left hand corner of the map before you come to Iceland um, I can see the butt of Lewis from my window here. Um, and this village to me is extremely special for lots of different reasons. <clears throat> and um, I listened to one of one of my friends who some of you will know, Hugh Cheap, Professor Hugh Cheap, um, who was with Museums of Scotland. And he gave a talk, an after dinner talk two or three years ago um, about another location. And it occurred to me that I had all that same information and more about this village here. And, and I woke up one morning, literally woke up one morning thinking that'll make a good book. Um, and talking about the world through the lens of this village. So from, from the time of the formation of the earth right through to the immediate future, um, I don't want to stop at the present. I wanted to sort of go in a little bit into the future, but not to have science fiction. I'm not a fan of science fiction. I'm, I'm, I'm a science fact person. Um, and, and the idea behind that was to follow it through and to look at everything, everything about the place, the, the geology, the, the, the bird species, the natural history um, of all sorts, the human history, the, 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 the way that this village has been portrayed in things like the big events like the Highland Clearances or the First World War, um, and not to deal with history. I'm not a historian per se, but not to look at the history without looking at how it would be seen through this village and it was just I wanted to sort of it was a, an experiment to myself that, that sort of worked out well and ended up in a book so yeah that was it really. Yeah that well that answers my next question was kind of what inspired you to write it but I think it sounds like really a love of place as well has inspired you. Absolutely absolutely. It's, I think it's um, it's yeah. interesting because there are so many books written, of course, about the the Outer Hebrides and the Inner Hebrides and Scotland in general, because so many people love it. But I think maybe perhaps there's um, a lack of voices from the places that are being written about. Would you agree? I think I would agree. Um, and a lot of a lot of my professional life has been about 
um, building that knowledge from, so, that, so there's an inside view and an outside view. And very often you'll find that crofters and fishermen and whatnot have a deep knowledge of the natural environment, but they don't talk about it in scientific terms. Um, and the people I've worked with um, in, in natural science or science organizations um, come in and think that people don't know anything about it because they don't understand um, you know, what a crex crex is or what, a, what, what some Latin species name is going to be about. And therefore, they're, they're just ignorant of these things. But there's actually a complementary knowledge with these things very often. And it's about finding that middle ground to explore that in ways that people actually understand that adds up to more than the sum of the parts, I think. Mm. I know exactly what you mean. I remember growing up in, in the rural highlands, loving rocks, but having no idea what any of them were called and trying to get a geology book and just opening the pages and it's all just gobbledygook. I've got no idea what any of it means. But if you ask me where, a, you know, a shiny rock with bitties in it was, I know where that is. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. Um, so in terms of geology and in terms of the living world, have you always been interested in this? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, when, when I went away to school, I went away to, we had a tradition at school camp when you're probably about primary five, a 10 year old, and you go away for a school summer camp. And, and, and well, it's during the term time and you learn, and I came back with a suitcase so heavy full of rocks and my father couldn't lift it. And that was me, I, I was hooked and I wanted to, I went to Aberdeen, did my, did my undergraduate, did my PhD. Um, worked as a natural scientist for the for what the old NCC Nature Conservancy Council for a while. Um, here in in the Hebrides, I, I was one of the few people who was employed in the place that they lived. Actually, in those days, I'm talking about 40 years ago. It was very much a colonial service. You were posted to people places that you didn't know because you didn't want to get too friendly with the locals, you know, and and, and go native. Um, but I was based here, and you wouldn't believe the number of times over the years that I've come back from somewhere, from work or from shopping or whatnot, and there's a stone on our doorstep, um, just a stone. And I know that somebody has been to call and we have not been here, and eventually I'll get a phone call that somebody will say, I left this stone on your doorstep. What is it? I found it in such and such a place and can you tell me what it is and so on. So I, I just put, when I come back and I find these stones, I just put them on one side and I know eventually someone will make contact and I'll have to explain what this rock is and <laughs> why it's there and why it's got red spots in it and what, what these red spots mean, what, what are garnets and whatever, you know. Um, people have a, have, a, have a real passion for geology, but they don't necessarily know. Geology is one of these subjects that gets, that gets quite deep quite quickly. And particularly if you're looking at Lewisian geology, the geology of Lewisian gneiss is superficially very similar. Uh, it's metamorphic rock, right? You can't go wrong there. It's been changed by something, heat and by pressure or whatnot. So it, it's, all, it's all been mucked up. But then when you go beyond that, it gets very, very complex, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and so people, and especially when you start talking about thousands of millions of years and, you know, and 500 million years here and a thousand million years there, you can see people just going, oh my God, you know, I'm just losing the will to live here. I can't understand what you're talking about. Which is why, and, and this, so the first chapter of this book is the first three, the first three billion years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because it's, you know, it's a blink of an eye really. Um, um, but in that time, we know so much about the place, but then we don't really know as much as we'd like to know about the place. And so the, the place where this village is, Galson, um, is around about 2.7, 3,000 million years old, three and about 1,000 million years old. Just about 10 miles north of here, we have the Ness Metasedimens, the Ness Metasedimentary Belt, which is literally another continent that's been squashed over the top of the old continent. And there's 1,500 million years old, the difference between here and there. It's, it's still Louisian nice, and it's still to the lay person probably looks exactly the similar, but they're completely different. And so the journey for this book, when I was thinking of this about writing the book, I was thinking, well, the Lysian was formed deep within the crust of the earth. It was formed, you know, what, 35 kilometers down, you know, um, we know the temperatures and pressures that were that were forming this at the time. It was it was in the root zone of something like a Himalayan mountain chain at that time. But where about on the surface of the planet was this? 
it wasn't here because because we know the the planets that are moving around with with the tectonic plates and whatnot where was it and I, I i didn't know and so i started digging around and all the scientific papers and i couldn't get any clear answer so I, I phoned um, who some of you might know, Graham Leslie. Who Graham, Graham was British George of Survey in Edinburgh. Graham did his PhD just, just a couple of years above me. So I phoned him out the blue uh, and, and asked him my question, where was the Louisian when it was forming? And there was a silence and he went, that's a really good question. <laughs> and so we went away and we dug around and we got various people and we got, uh, and basically Lewis was down near the South Pole at that time. Um, and it's moved over the years to this thing. So when you look at it on those huge scales, one of the themes of the book is about change is inevitable. It's how you cope with change and how you follow change that is important. And change isn't something you can really stop. You can mitigate it. You can you can defer the worst, you know, of the of the the results of change. But you cannot stop change. So understanding what makes that change is really important. And so starting from 3,000 million years ago and following, um, one of the things I tried to do with some of the tours I take here, for example, just with friends, is point out simple things that they can see in the rocks, simple things they can understand without thinking, we haven't, we haven't got the benefit of, of, of people like you, Elsa, to, to look at uh, fossils in, in the, in the, in the Louisiana Nights because they've all been mucked up beyond recognition, you know? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we haven't got that to fall back on, but, but you can look at things like pegmatites and the odd dike and you know, amphibolite pods and so on and so forth. You can, you can point out things and explain boudinage and all these different things that you can, you can show people. And then they can then look for it and at least get a little bit of glimpse into what was happening at that particular time. I think there's a couple of really interesting things I want to pick up on what you've, you've just been saying. First is to clarify, because a thousand million years is a billion. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're talking in billions of years. And I think that's um, conceptually, it's very difficult, isn't it? Really, actually, once we go past a few thousand years, it almost all is all the same. It's funny that it, it, three billion years ended up being one chapter, because actually, when you talk to people about time, after a certain point, it could be a million, it could be a thousand million. It's just so long ago, it's, no, almost, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's almost meaningless, isn't it? Uh, so that was striking me. I think that's, and I think that's a particularly interesting thing with regards to the Outer Hebrides, because they are so ancient, as you point out. Am I right in understanding they are some of the oldest rocks in the whole of the UK, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, and there's a spot on the shore here, which, um, it might be the eye of faith. It might just be me um, hallucinating on a on a good summer's day, and whatnot. But there's a there's a spot on the shore here, just a few hundred meters from where I'm sitting just now, that I think, in a certain light, is it looks different from the surrounding Louisian nice. and I think that's a lens of the protolith within the Louisian nice that is three and a half thousand million years old. So I think I think this protolith could be around, well, who knows, without dating it, it's impossible to know. But I think if I can get someone to persuade that to look at this, we're looking at 4,000 or 4,000, 4.2 thousand million years old. So it's among the oldest rock on the planet, definitely, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and the planet's four and a half. What happened in that time, you know? Yeah, the planet's four and a half billion years old. So you're yeah. thinking maybe yeah. four point two. I mean, that's quite close to the. That's the childhood of the world, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So a protolith, I'm assuming, is a bit of much older rock that ends up inside much younger rock. Is that it's right? A, it's, a, it's almost like a little within it, with a, like a little like a little lens within within an enclosing rock and whatnot. There is something marked in the geological survey map, and it, it corresponds to this area of the shore that I'm thinking about. And you can't always see it because in a certain light, but you can see in a certain light, you can see that the texture of the rock seems to be different. There's a little tear shaped like lens of, of rock within that. And, and I've convinced myself most unscientifically that this is part of the protolith and I'm sticking with that until you prove me wrong. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think people should be encouraged to, to do what you've just done, where you look at something and you just try to figure it out for yourself and, and actually not be frightened because it doesn't really matter if you're wrong, does it? I mean, it's yeah. just, but, but it's a really interesting question and you might manage to find somebody who can help answer it. But uh, the other thing I was thinking about when you were talking about where was Lewis all that time ago 
is there's a really there's another strange conceptual thing which is that a sense of a place uh, so is Lewis still Lewis if it's at the South Pole is I guess what I'm going to get at like that a place is is still a place even if it's displaced what is it that makes a place a place do you think okay so so this so this book getting to that getting to the roots of the book there the book is about <clears throat> what makes a place special and this this place to me um, you you were joking at the start, I know, but I, I I take you on your word that you know you're in remote Oxford, and I am I am the centre of the universe, sitting here in Golson, you know, um, and and everybody is remote from me, not me from them, mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of it. So I look at within the book, I look chapter by chapter, and bring up things that are that try to make people think differently about about the place. So for example, when it gets onto the Norse period and the and the the Iron Age, the Vikings coming here, you know, in a thousand years ago, this was not remote from them. This was in the forefront of European culture. In the eighth century, you know, the west of Ireland was the cultural center of Europe. Uh, you know, the Book of Kells was written in a, it was, was was written in Iona, for goodness sake. They, these are these are things that, were, and it was only traveling on land that was difficult. If you were at sea and you had a boat, you could go anywhere. Islands were not remote. Islands were the nodes that connected things together because the boat allowed you to go anywhere. But if you're on land, there were no roads. You either walked or you rode a horse because you couldn't drive or you couldn't even take a car because there was nowhere to go. And so that changes your ideas about positioning. And so, you know, one of the things they say about a space is just a space until it gets a name. And when you begin to act with it, then it becomes a place. And when it becomes a place, it adds on other things allied to that place, memories and events and hu human interaction, or oh, the place that I gather bird's eggs, or the place that I go for walking on, on summer, summer mornings or whatnot, you then add human experiences onto place, it then becomes a lived place, and that place is somewhere different. And, you know, towards the end of the book, I say that Lewis won't always be here, you know, long, long after we've gone, it will have drifted somewhere further north and further east perhaps who knows with the with the convection currents but it, it won't be here um, it'll be somewhere different and the surface of the earth that we're looking at now will be even further eroded so it won't you won't even be looking at the land surface we're looking at just now it will change and so it's about learning to understand that that change within that wider perspective of things that you know this is why i say you don't i don't talk about being on lewis on Lewis, to me, is a, is a perspective somewhere far away that, that, that's looking at me standing on this rock in the middle of the Atlantic, whereas I am in the environment of this place. I am in Lewis. I am in this place, in its totality. You know, the, the whole the, the physical place, but also the soundscape and the, and the physical environment, the wind and, and the sun. So that's, that, that gives a place its special name. What other things make it special? Particular histories, particular you know, associations, um, famous people that have passed through and le left their memories of the place and so on. And we've got a lot of these things as they pass through. And, you know, it's not to say that this place is any better than anywhere else. You might have your favourite place in, I don't know, the west coast of Sutherland or the north coast of Caithness or Sky or whatever else it is. You, you'll have your own special place. But what makes that place special for you? What... what if you drill down to these things, it's a combination of, for me, starting with the rocks and the topography and the geology and the, the land and the soils and the vegetation on these soils and then the species that live within these, the birds that you see every day. Um, all these things combine to make a place special and that adds up to something different. Yeah, I, mean, I think your, your, your deep sort of intimacy that you have with the landscape is really obvious in in the book I've actually I mean I don't know if you could see but I've marked all these different bits in it where I just I would have to stop for five minutes and think about what you just wrote because I felt that you painted such very very vivid intimate pictures of of actually very very small places of land I don't mean that in a I don't mean that in a detrimental sense I mean just you you spent an entire paragraph just describing at one point the just a few plants in one piece of bog and I was just so struck by the detail of that but it wasn't a, a, a sort of overwhelming scientific detail it was an intimacy it was a love for the landscapes I think it 
it really does come through. And I, I guess you've kind of answered this question, but I, yeah, I mean, in fact, yeah, I'll not ask you that. I was going to say, you know, do you think that you have to be from a place in order to be able to write like that about it? What do you think? Or do you think this is something like you were just saying, this is not saying that one place is better than another. Uh, also, perhaps not saying that you necessarily need to originally be from a place. It's what it's a place that is special to you that you can actually have this connection with. Correct. Correct. I think that is very true. I think I can't I can't honestly remember if I put it in these words, but it's a really good one of our another academic in rural development was writing about um, development in Asia um, and had a really good a really good sort of telescopic view of these things, which I've sort of paraphrased, I guess, in some, some respects in the book, that when people talk about this place, um, it's only a tiny little bit that they get because most people come in summertime. They don't come in wintertime, in the bad weather. When they do come in the summertime, they don't leave the tarmac. They don't leave the road. They only go to places they can drive. Yeah, and then they only go to places where they think there's something happening that's worth seeing, whether it's a tourist or a project or whatnot. And when they get there, they only speak to people who speak their language um, and people who are willing to speak to them, which are quite often the sort of elders in the community and the male, the elder male or the elder female. And so the other people that are there don't get their voice shared. So if you're a, a five-year-old kid living in that that speaks Gaelic rather than English, you don't even you don't even appear on the radar and so they get a tiny part of a tiny part of a tiny part of a tiny part of a tiny part you know and that's what they see that's what they take away whereas i know for example um if you leave the car and walk 10 50 minutes out on the moor you will be in a completely different landscape mm. there are if you go a certain route out behind me literally over my shoulder out, out following the river and you go over a hill and you come down to a sort of rock basin that, that stretches out in the moorland for well it's one of the biggest unbroken you know natural peat bog um, moorlands in, in Europe um, you come very quickly to a place where you can't see that you can't see the sea you, where you come from if I took you out there blindfolded you and spun you around you wouldn't know which way to, to start walking back and you could walk for two days and see nobody, or three days, depending which direction you went. And so that that the enormity of that landscape uh, is impossible. I, I, I've as part of biological recording, the number of times that I've actually been with people who have recorded this, that, or the other, and and that's the first time it's been recorded for here. It's not because it's not because it's rare here. It's because the people who recognise it and record it for biological science have never been there, and, and so they don't they don't find it. They don't record you know recognise these things. So there's so much more to be discovered of this place. It, it, it literally is like the Serengeti of the North, and <laughs> and, and and when people talk about these. It, I'm working on a book just now, another book just now about landscape and how we perceive landscape. And again, I'm saying to people, you know, when people look at this and say, what a, what a barren moorland that is, oh my God, what a place. I don't recognize that language. I, I you know, my, barrenness for me is looking at my hotel room when I'm in London, looking at, and all I see is roofs and concrete. And I think, oh my God, where have I come to? What am I, how can I where, where, where is the greenness, you know? Um, so I think it's the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but so it so is special places, and and getting to getting to the roots of that. What makes it special for you is, mm. is different for each one of us. It's a very personal experience, but we can begin to share some of these things. And and I think you know it's very much intrinsic in the Gaelic language. I'm I'm not evangelizing here, but in terms of the Gaelic language, in the Gaelic language and how that belongs and how that describes place. And relates to place is, is is very much different from from English language, um, and that appreciation of place is, is is quite profound in terms of your understanding about what you're looking at. Yeah, I was actually going to bring that up because this is one of the things that's been fascinating me. You talk in in the book about um, the the very sort of almost precise naming of places that you can have a place that's named as the good place to hide while you're hunting for deer. And that's the actual name of a very specific location. Yeah. Um, and, and there's lots of words in, in Gaelic, it seems, that are, are so 
very particular about the type of soil, for example, is it good for planting or not, or whether a field is good for for a particular type of grazing, this kind of things. It, it's clear that that people had a, an extremely close tie with their landscape and knew exactly what to do with it. Do you think Gaelic is, or do do you know, is Gaelic unusual in being that intimately tied to the landscape? Or is it just more that English is unusual in that we've lost all those kinds of words? Do you think this was something that all language would have once had? Oh, I think so. I think I've had, I've had lots of conversations with that. I think I think that English has lost a lot of these things, and pe people will say that you know that this there is no and there is no direct translation for many things that we talk about in Gaelic in English. It's it, it's a subdivision of a subdivision of understanding the micro environment. But actually, there are direct comparisons with other indigenous languages. I've talked with, with, with Maori in New Zealand and with First Nation people in Canada, and we, we have the same understanding. It's a different ecology, a different landscape, but, it, but they have the same mentality. You know, there's a famous book by Bruce Chapman on song lines going, going across, singing his way across, across uh, Australia through the Aboriginal song lines where you, you inherit songs from your parents. Um, and it describes the land you're going to, well, Gaelic is, is, is quite similar to that. And if you understand the language of, 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 of the place, then there's a lot of geology in the landscape. You know, you'll see Ben Jarag. Ben Jarag is the red mountain. And so if, if I tell you, you go, up this, go up this glen, go up this valley, you know, turn left at the Fahan, where, where the small streams come in, um, and you'll see Ben Jurig on your left, the Red Mountain, and on the left you'll see Ngodu, the, 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 the Black Gully, you will know where to walk, even mm -hmm. though you've not been there. Okay, you understand the language that if they're just sounds to you, if they're just phonetic things that you see in the map and don't understand that, then it's, you know, I, I mentioned the book one time I was, I was doing a study in the area and I was actually looking at Terran colonies and, and, and one of my friends who's not from here came up there and, and said, I've, I've discovered a new term collie. And I went, oh, brilliant. I got my map out. Where is it? And he put his finger on the map and right under his finger, the, the Ordnance Survey had named this Blarn and Scharnock, the field of terns. <laughs> you know? And I said, it's been known that way for 3000 years, mate. You know, the, you know, you, you know. so uh, I think the geology is, is quite, ge particularly in topography, and particularly in physical geology, mm -hmm. then, then it's a hugely descriptive language that is actually, I think, richer than... So we, we talk about the Roche Moutoni, you know, in glacial, glacial knolls that are, that are scraped up and then plucked out in the sky. So in, in geology, we talk about Roche Moutoni. Why did we use that French word? Because we have a perfectly good word in Gaelic English, you know, called stuk. They're called stooks. You know, and, and th that's what we call them in Gaelic. It's a, it's a stook and they point in the, in the direction with their tail up towards the direction of where the ice came from. So there's a natural affiliation with understanding the landscape and the nature because people were close to the land and had to know, as you say, what were the good bits for planting crops and hunting for deer and so on and so forth. So there's definitely a, a, a and, and medicinal plants as well. So it's more than just that. But topography, I think, is, is, is quite, quite particular in this one here. So landscapes obviously shaped language in that way, or, or at least the two have gone hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. In what ways has the geology and landscape, do you think, influenced the people of the, of the Outer Hebrides and the culture that's developed there? Do you think there are direct ties? Well, there are. I mean, this village here in particular, that, so in this small, I guess, maybe three, four kilometres of coastline here, this is one of the few areas in the entire west coast uh, of the Hebrides that has a raised beach. Um, and everywhere else further south has been that moving ice has scraped it off and dumped it away off the, off the continental shelf, off towards St Kilda. But in this small area here where I'm sitting, um, there is a, there's still a raised beach. And on that raised beach, there is the, the Norse settlements, and before that, there are Iron Age villages on the raised beach. And before that, there are remnants of agricultural and even some graves just for the, for the southwest of me here that are so old that, that even in folk memory, we don't know what they are. We have no idea. So people have lived here, not just 
not just Tudors and Stuarts and, and Hanoverians and so on in, in terms of the, the you know, uh, monastic dynasties, but entire civilizations have lived here and been wiped out and overseeded and intermarried and one on top of the other, several upon the others. And they're based upon this area here. And you it follows through, they're here because of the geology. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason I, I just discovered in the course of doing this book, actually, um, I was speaking with the Edinburgh Geology Society and then I got an, an email afterwards from somebody else who said, actually, I, I've done some work there and I'm coming up on holiday. Do you want to go for a walk? And we did. Um, he, he, he works for one of the Scandinavian um, geological surveys. Um, and he has a convincing convincing um, theory about why the race beach was preserved here. And it's not the accepted, and it's not the, the current um, accepted a uh, description on that it isn't the fact that the that there was no moving ice here it's the fact that the as has happened in other areas and, and been shown in other parts of the world the ice the ice sheet here froze to the surface of the of the of the ground and then cracks appeared within the ice and so the ice fractured within itself and carried on moving over itself out into the sea but didn't actually scrape along the land surface and so the land surface wasn't scraped off and removed and so and just in this small part here we have interbedded sands and peats and gravels and peats and sand and peat um, and it's possibly one of the still prime areas for research and understanding the the sea level shift up and down um, in the in the years after the the, the decades or, or whatever after after the last major ice sheet it was here because it actually documents in the in the in the, the strata in the land um, that this was not just a ice melting seas, you know, rising things flooding over and whatnot. This was a this was a, a very much a sort of up and down and, and fracture process. And there's still a lot of work to be done in this. So that, that was that was quite something quite new actually. He's he's published since then as well. So I think this is still an ongoing story that we haven't got to the bottom of yet. Oh, it's really quite amazing. <coughs> And, and just like almost inconceivable, I can't quite imagine how that works. And it's, and it's interesting talking about the different layers of uh, human habitation in a landscape because it, you used the same hand gesture you used when you were talking about the different layers of Louisian nice. So it's almost like a, a human geology, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of people moving through, of, like ice ages moving through a landscape. But it makes me think about something that you mentioned in one of the chapters um, quite early on, where you're talking about animal distribution in Hebrides and Scotland as a whole. Um, and you talk about how red deer made it uh, to the Hebrides after the Ice Age, but you were suggesting that perhaps Norse settlers had brought them. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I was quite interested by, by that, that story that you tell in that. Well, I mean, the, there are several things that, I mean, in, in putting together this book, there were, you know, I've been here most of my life, so you, you, I'm, I'm interested in the in the in all the different aspects of the place. So, I've collected stories over the years, and 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 everything from you know, plants and and animal species and topography, climate, you name it, over the years. Um, but it's also it also encouraged me to follow up threads and pull the thread and see where the thread ends up and quite a few things during this book they ended up in places that I didn't expect and one of them was the red deer because um, we know historically within 19th century onwards there were various introductions of deer by the landed estates so they could go shooting them they go hunting them stalking them and so on so we know that was the case and it was assumed that deer had been here like forever. But then as more information became available, it became obvious that there wasn't really a land bridge or an ice bridge to the, to the extent that people thought. So deer did not come across from the mainland. So yeah. how did- yeah, so how, how, long, how long has the Minch existed? Yeah, exactly. And there are deep folks within the Minch. So it's not just a, it's not, it's not just a, it's not just a sort of a, a, a flooded trench as it were. Um, more recent DNA studies have shown that the deer in the Hebrides are actually related not to mainland deer and not even to Scandinavian deer. So it's not exactly clear where the parent stock came from. Um, but they came here, obviously, 
Um, and the Vikings were known to introduce um, sheep, for, for example, St Kilda sheep, soy sheep, as it were, you know, Shetland sheep. They left them on various islands to come back as a sort of living larder on these things. Uh, so I, I'm speculating on the possibility that, that they came with they came with uh, with um, with Norse travelers because they weren't all warriors. They were they were settlers and they, they were traders as well. Um, and that perhaps was part of the part of the introduction to the stock here because it's only relatively recently that we realised that these things have not been here. They're not, they're not indigenous. At one point, it was thought to be one of the two indigenous animals in the Hebrides, but we realised that if you go back far enough, they're not indigenous at all. They've come from somewhere else, like, like everybody else. They're refugees from somewhere, um, uh, and they've come in. And so that is fascinating because that is still, again, an unresolved story. And if you look at, if you look at um, bird species, I mean, the, the species that were common even in my grandfather's day, are less common now. And there are introductions, things like the great skewer, the bonkses, they, they have come. That was one of the first scientific um, studies I did when I was here as a, maybe a, a, I'd say a teenager or, or early 20s, was mapping the, the, the arrival of skewers from Shetland because they arrived out in the moor and, and one year they were just there. You know, people that didn't know how long they'd been there, but they'd been there for, for obviously long enough to feel comfortable. Um, it was only when they, when they became close enough in and they came into the villages and they began to buzz people who went out into the peats because their nests were too near. And then people, because they're quite aggressive, people remember the first time they saw a bonksy. Um, uh, and so that they, they, they came from, and I, I, I put adverts out in local community newsletters for, for doing this sort of citizen science survey about the, the spread of bonksies throughout the Hebrides. And my mother-in-law was getting phone calls from people who were saying, I've, I've found Frank's birds, when is he going to come and take them away? And, you know, because, because they remembered exactly the year and the place they saw these things. Um, and so we knew when they arrived. They, they arrived this year, this spring, they weren't there the year before. And so there's a constant change in these things. You know, we're looking at a variety of, um, we know that some birds, for example, are becoming less common because of changing agriculture, changing climate. Mm. Um, but other things are becoming more common. Um, and it fascinates me when you look at that in fine grain detail, even things like the wheat ear, the, the small wheat ear that's this size with a, a white bum that flits from fence post to fence post, they, they go to West Africa when they're not here, you know? Um, the Arctic terns, they go to, they go to the Southern, Southern Ocean and they come back again. So there's a constant crisscrossing all over the place. So the idea that these things, um, that this is a remote place, it's quite unusual that they wouldn't recognize that. This is the center of their world as well. And they just happen to flit around in different places. So it's, it's fascinating how you, you know, geology is, is, the, is the exception in that in this case, because it, it, as I say, it gets quite complex quite quickly and you need to have big science to get around to the roots of what it was like at the start of the planet. Um, the, days, the days when, the days when People can actually make huge discoveries um, just with a notebook and a pencil. Uh, is, 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 with, with geology, is, is, is quite difficult, other than finding strange fossils in the sky, of course. But we're not going to, we're not going to go into that one. I'm not going to give you oh, that. <laughs> that's far too recent as well compared to what we're talking about here. That's, that was only 166 million years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, what you're saying there about the, these changes and, and these seemingly new species arriving and some disappearing and that constant state of change and and also whether or not deer for example are are natural and I'll use air quotes because what I was going to say is that's all very interesting because it challenges what our idea of the natural state of any place should be uh, and this is I think particularly an interesting subject in Scotland because of our history but in in Lewis specifically uh, I'd like to talk about that in relation to the rewilding ideas that we, we see a lot of people talking about now. Um, you know, what is your, you talk a little bit about it in the book, um, about challenging people's idea of what is the natural state. And if we're saying we're going to rewild and we want to get back to some kind of pristine state, but when then we're saying, for example, deer have only been here for, I don't know, however many thousand years, at what point do we pick the natural state? Um, what are your thoughts on, on that whole subject? I get, I get a bit 
concern that we're talking about rewilding because rewilding is kind of it's kind of vague language mm. um, re- going back to what going back yeah. to going back to some previous um sort of rose tinted spectacles day that is not quite we don't know what the habitat was like then ten thousand years ago and, and exactly um, we can we can reconstitute vegetation from pollen samples and so on and so forth, but the, the details of the college are quite difficult. If they, if they mean by rewilding, getting back to a more natural, um, you know, less intrusive natural environment, I'm thoroughly in favour of that. Mm. Um, if you mean if you mean making the place more wild or protecting a place because you perceive it to be wild, then I immediately start to wonder because. Most of this area that I'm looking at is wild only because people were forcibly removed from it. They were cleared from the area. And if you go back, and there are, there are lots of good studies looking at this, and if you go back um, in the areas when crofting villages and, and, and settlements and essentially peasant farming was in these parts of the highlands and islands, um, the biodiversity was much higher in those areas because they they had little patches of oats and little patches of corn and they had patches of grass and potatoes and so on and so forth. Um, And so there was much more mosaic habitat mix. And when you remove those people, it's gone to heather or to bracken or to to deer grass and so on and so forth. They're very much more of a, more of a, 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 a monotonous ecology. So it's less, it's only wild because you've manufactured it by taking people out there. If you really want a healthy natural environment, you want to actually re-people the land as well. You really want to get people back into the work in the landscape and, and encouraging things like, uh, you know, growing hay to give to cows because that encourages corn buntings and corn creek and so on and so forth within the environment. So it's, it's quite, a, I think people, have, a, have some sort of quite often a very simplistic idea that rewilding has gone back to nature in, in, a, in a way that we can turn back the clock without actually knowing what you're turning it back to. Yeah, how far are you turning it back? How far do you put back and what you need to put into place to make that happen? To make that, to make that happen, for example, chuffs in the landscape, you need to have more cattle. And you to have more cattle, you need to have more people looking after the cattle um, and, and small areas of croftland vegetation and so on and so forth. So these things are intimately, this is not for nothing that Fraser Darling's great book on the West Island survey was subtitled An Essay in Human Ecology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we have to think about that in terms of the human place. When you think about the human separate from the landscape, then that makes completely sense to make it a wild landscape. If you think about humans as an integral part of that landscape, albeit one that's come to dominate and destroy certain areas um, because of the way we treat the land, um, then you, you, you then twist the argument and actually make it less, less easy to follow and less, less, less true, there's less integrity in that argument. Mm. Well, um, we're in the last 15 minutes, so I just want to remind our audience that if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, uh, pop them in the chat or let me know that you'd like to ask them. Um, But I do have another question I would like to ask. Um, So this is kind of looping back around right back at the start. We we were uh, well, in fact, just a wee minute ago, we were talking about the minch and on page 71 in your book you say um, close to shore, the ocean shelf off the west coast of the islands is shallow and gently shelving, but that on the eastern coast, it's steeply faulted to permit very deep water close to shore. So Mm. that's in the Minch itself. And you talk about how this affects the distribution of marine mammals in the Minch. And I imagine it also affects the sailing and therefore um, people's movements. So I'm really interested in that. Uh, first of all, I, to ask you why that is the case. Why is there such deep water in the Minch when it shelves on the other side? What causes that? There's a major fault just just off the off the off the east coast of, of uh, the Hebrides, off the east coast of the Hebrides. There's a major the Minch fault, um, and it's the same as you know the the sole thrust in Ascent or any of these big overarching naps of rock that's been thrust over and there's a huge deep fall just off the off the west coast which means that there's very deep water very close inshore so it's a great place for cetaceans for whales porpoises dolphins they come right in you can on stand on land and watch these things just off the shore whereas on the west coast you have much more sloping out towards the continental shelf and so you have 
thousands or millions of years of sand being generated and thrown up and washed away and thrown up and washed away. And so down the beach here, just a, you know, literally a few hundred meters from where I'm sitting, um, you go down one day in the winter time and there's no sand, it's all gone. Uh, and you think, oh, that's a pity. And then two months later, it's thick in sand again because it's come back from somewhere else. And this has been going on for, for millennia. And this is why things like the Macher, the Macher land, in the, and particularly in the US and the southern part of, the, of Lewis and Harris, you have this sandy um, grass, you would call it links in the east coast of Scotland, the, the sandy coastal grassland plain protected by a, a, a set of dune, sand dune ridges on, 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 the, on the, uh, the seaward side. Um, and these have been recycled over the years um, as a sort of coastal barrier for that. And so you have this, you know, different topography basically. And the sand, where the sand has mixed and come in to join the peat of the, of the, the acid peat of the, of the inland areas, you have this black land mixing that is really fertile, and it's along that that interdigitating link of of black black land that you find all the crofting villages. Oh, can I ask actually what forms the marker? How does that? Where does that yeah. sand come from? It's shell sand. It's she, it's it's just crushed shells. This is these, these wonderful white beaches. These are just pure crushed shells over millennia and washed up and washed up again as it goes through there. Okay, so with with there being that big difference offshore on either side of the island, has that affected settlement and use of the sea itself on either side of the island? Absolutely, because most of the, in, in places like Lewis, most of the villages will be along the, the west coast because they're more accessible and only a few places on the east coast. Um, there'll be gaps, quite, quite a large gaps along the east coast because they're much more cliff bound and they could not get down to the shore to launch boats for, for, for fishing in, in the days when people were dependent upon growing crops and fishing at the same time. So I think there's only one village in Lewis that's not on the coast. You know? Oh, where's that? Um, down, at, down at Achmore, the, the, where, where the crossroads come from east and west and north and south and they pass there and someone put a house there at some point and it grew up into a small village. Oh, like a crossroads village. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, ah, now I've just noticed a question pop up. Um, so, is it Fra Angus is asking Frank, is it possible to live in a city and possibly other parts of the country and pay no attention to the landscape and for for it to have no influence on you? Do you think it's intrinsic to places like Dalston uh, that it's so intrinsic that it's impossible for the landscape not to influence people who live there? I think you probably could be here and not be influenced by the landscape, but there are there are Philistines everywhere, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I I don't. So I think I think to be a to be a purist. I'm actually working on another book just now, which which I'm provisionally titled um, "Among the Layers of the Land," and it's about how we look at land and how we look at landscape. So in that book there, I would say that even if you're in a city, the land influences you. Mm. You might have less influence than if you're in a, in a windswept moor in Caithness or a top of a hill in Harris or whatever, but the land still influences you and it still has an, an impact upon you in the sense that you, you, will have, you will still have to, you know, you'll buying your, your vegetables in a supermarket that's grown on a farm on the edge of the city or whatever else it is. So there will be some link to it, however far back it goes. I think the more close you come to that land, then to living on the land, then it influences you in lots of lots of different ways. I think I think the influence is there. You might not perceive it in the same way. You may not understand it in the same way. Um, and I think quite often this is why. So I mean, if I, if I was to be controversial and why not because it never stopped me before if you if you're if you're if you're thinking people people will come to a place like this and they'll fall in love with the beauty of the place and the white sands and the and you know and the the wide open spaces the big skies if you're on a promontory here you have you have 120 100 180 190 you know 200 degrees of of, of sea around you it goes back on both sides and this huge enormous sky and, and so they, they get some release from that, they get some pleasure, enjoyment in that. 
Um, and then they want to come and live here. And quite often we'll look at them and say, that's a one winter family. That's a two winter family because um, they, they've, like, as I said earlier, they've, they've only come in the summertime. They've only come in good weather. They've never left the road. They've never had to, you know, never had a pair of wellies in their life or, or whatever, you know. It's, so, so it's not about, and it's about, it's a certain um, closeness, familiarity within that. I mean, personally, I could not imagine living anywhere else. I, I, I literally, quite literally think that if I was, and I have lived in a city, obviously, when I was, when I was at university, when I was studying and whatnot, um, and I had, I've had enough of that. That was, that was 40 odd years ago, maybe a bit more. Um, and I think if I was to be plucked up and put in a city now, then I would, I would be like a plant pot that's lifted out of the, I, I would get weaker and weaker and grayer and grayer and eventually wilt away into some yeah. corner and whatnot. And what, Whereas, whereas here I can I can I can appreciate the whole variety of the the, the 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 environment around you, and it changes day by day by day by wherever you go. And if you if you compare that with things like you know, as I say, I'm not saying this is this, this is special to me, but I can equally imagine my that my compatriots who are living in who are living in. I don't know, Orkney or rural Wales or Cumbria or whatnot, have the same feeling about their part of the part of the earth and their part of the turf of because their heritage is bound up with that place there and they understand the, the workings of the landscape and the naming of the places and so on and so forth. Where to me, as, a, as, a, as an outsider, I'd be just a fly on the wall looking at these things and say, well, it's very bonny, but I need to go home now. <laughs> It's funny because it almost feels like, you know, your book is almost a good guide for someone else to go back to wherever is special to them and to say, right, ask the same questions. What yes. are the rocks under my feet? What are the plants that I can see in the mirror? What animals are living Absolutely. in the woods? And, and gain the same kind of level of appreciation. Um, I, yeah, I, in fact, I literally just had this conversation two nights ago with an Italian and a, a Spaniard here at the museum, and they were both going on about how much they missed the sun and the quality of the sun. And I was telling them how I miss the rain. <laughs> I really, really yeah. hate how dry it is down here. Yeah. I just feel like I feel like you're describing a flower wilting because I need yeah. to get watered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, Leslie said in the chat, um, living on London clay, you know it when you dig in the garden. Yeah. So that's an interesting point, actually, about soils. Yeah. What I mean, you talked a little bit about people's perception of the Outer Hebrides as being this barren moor and there's nothing really else. What is the soil like in the Hebrides? I don't know much about that. Soil of the, the soil of the Hebrides is very unforgiving. It's a mineral soil that's come from, come from Louisian, so it's silicate rich and very shallow. Um, I have a croft here. It goes down there from the bottom of the, the bottom of the slope here. It's reasonably deep and, and reasonably good good um, grassland. When I go up the hill in the back there, I know because I've tried to dig holes to bury sheep, etc. Um, and, and the soil is about 18 inches deep, and then and then you hit boulder clay or you hit you know solid rock. So there's there's nothing. You're not going to you're not going to be able to plow these things up very deeply or not. If you go further out the other way, uh, the, f further towards the sort of straight east, then you're into deep peat, um, and the peat down there in some bits might be maybe 35, 36 feet deep. Um, you're looking at you know you're looking at big well obviously in the hollows it will pop up this sort of very thin on, on the top of the the top of the knolls and so on, and, and maybe maybe a rocks will, will pop pop out the pop out the surface of the earth, the bedrock will pop out the, and, and be bare at the top. But in the in the deep hollows, you're looking at, you know, easily three, four, five, sometimes 10 meters of peat. Um, and that's really, and that's acid. So that's not going to go in that as well. So you're not going to, you're not, this is not going to be prime farmland. This has always been subsistence land. And if you look at the land, there's some areas in this area, because there's a sort of natural raised beach followed up by a, a natural rise in the hill. So there's almost like a sort of amphitheater, a, sort of a large three kilometers long, maybe half a kilometer wide amphitheater facing the, facing the sea, facing the facing northwest of the Atlantic. And if you look at that in a certain light, you can see as if the land has been combed, you can see marks of striations and lines. And that's what that's what they call in Gaelic, Gaelic Fianagan, Fianagan. Um, and the English term is lazy bed. 
Um, and it's, it's when the ground was turned on both sides and turned into the middle. So you have a double thickness of earth and a ditch on both sides. And then that double thickness of earth, they planted the, the crops and the vegetables in there. That was hard work. And when, when agriculture was improved, these were the first things to be abandoned. But you can still see these workings on the land. And these workings on the land will literally go back five, 6,000 years at least we don't know how far they're back because there's no material culture associated with them. Um, it's difficult and, and you know, people who were living there were probably, I would imagine living in just hides and tents and so on, not, not in physical rock structures. Um, and if they, if they weren't, the rocks have been reused over the years and whatnot. So it's impossible to, to date them you know, with, with, with classical um, techniques. So we don't know how far back these things go, but we know that these things go back beyond beyond recorded history. So we go back at least 5,000, 6,000 years ago. So there's been successive people using this land for various ways, but as things have changed over the years, then they've moved on to other more, less intensive, less labor intensive ways of doing these things, I guess. Is there some evidence for a quite different landscape in Lewis as well, isn't there? There's evidence for like woodland, hazel woodland and things. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So the bottom of our peats, um, there'll be about maybe, I would say two, um, maybe about three, maybe four meters down. There's two layers of peats about, each about maybe about five feet deep. Um, at the bottom of that, you'll see roots of and branches of trees that have been left after the last ice age. They're, they're 10,000 years old and whatnot. You'll find these roots. What, and if you pull them out and dry them, they will dry to just looks like a modern birch, for example, with silver bark on it. And, you know, so that we know these things have been taking place. We know, and I found as a, a description in the book here about, uh, I found a bronze harness mount uh, on the shore in a, in a patch of sand that's over a thousand years old. It's, it, it's, a, it's a harness mount from a horse with inlaid enamel. Um, and it's, there were only two found like it, one from a Viking grave in Norway, one from a Viking grave in the Isle of Man, and the third one from here, from a Viking, an old Viking settlement. And they were so similar in their manufacture, they may have been made in the same workshop. They're evidence of this trading link between the west of Norway, the west of Scotland, down through Isle of Man, down into Ireland, you know? And so there's a whole history of human people moving up and down these places to reuse that, you know, re reconfigure this land. And, and, and the people who came here, the, this village is, um, I know has an old Viking settlement on the shore there, but no fortifications. There's no defensive works. So the people were living here long enough to feel secure and to feel they didn't need to defend the place. So they came here maybe as warriors, but they stayed and they married and they intermarried with the people who were here and they, and they settled within these areas. And so they created a whole new culture that's been, and they renamed quite often the landscapes. So, so you'll see them, some, some places will have double Gaelic and, and Norse names or a Norse name spelled in the Gaelic orthography again. So it's, a, it's a bit like detective story, just trying to look at a, look on a map, you know? Yeah. Well, um, uh, one final thing, actually, so Ian Gillies has just said in the chats that he lived in Caithness for 40 years and felt that the place really shaped him. And I thought this is quite an interesting thing to perhaps finish on, is to, to ask you in what way you think being of Lewis uh, or, or the Outer Hebrides in general, and perhaps, I guess, islands, um, so-called remote islands, how it shapes people and perhaps yourself as well. In what ways do you think that that, that geography of being separated by water has shaped the culture and shaped yourself? Um, that's an interesting question. I think, I think you'd be, you, you tend to become much more self-reliant, I think. Um, you don't wait for people to come and do things for you. You need to go and do it, you need to go and do it. So, um, you know, for example, I, I would rather be, and we, we get a lot of wind here, so we, we don't get a lot of snow. If we get one day of snow a year, that's it, ever. Um, but we get a hell of a lot of wind. Um, and, and wind, you know, um, it was 40, 50 miles an hour earlier on this week here, um, which is a fair blow. Um, but that's not that's not scary. When it gets to 150, then you start thinking, you know, <laughs> I maybe better go in. <laughs> yeah. I take the washing in, you know. Um, yeah. 
Uh, but um, it certainly it, it makes you think of these things on a, on, a, on a bigger scale. And if you're thinking on these, um, the land, the landscape in that sense, the 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 sense of power in in the natural environment. Um, I would rather be here in the middle of a hundred mile an hour wind than the middle of a city, because in the city there's all sorts of stuff flying around there. You don't, you know, slates and wheelie bins and God knows what else. Whereas here, um, everybody has either the savvy to take it inside when that when it's going to, or else, or else it blew away in the last last storm. And so you haven't got, any, you know, there's nothing to worry about. It's not going to, it's not going to cause a problem. But it's it's about how you, you know, react to these things. Um, and I think that 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 construct of how you how you actually exist in a place like this is is much more is much more long term and i don't think I, I don't think i don't think you have to be born and brought up to it i think certain people adapt to it very well and some people will never adapt to it some people were born and brought up here and 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 really just they need to get away they need to go and be somewhere else um mm -hmm. and they may have come back from 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 holiday here sort of thing so there's a whole tradition about island families you know coming back here for the summer and their kids coming up for the summer holidays and whatnot and and actually we see it in Gaelic we say if, if if you were coming here Elsa and I met you off the plane or the ferry and whatnot um, and I said oh or, or I see you in town in the supermarket I would say ah good hang a good guy when did you come home <laughs> you know, I know this is not your home um, but it's an arrogance of, of the island of they see that well if it's not Poor soul, it should be, you know. So, so it's when, when did, and so the language is when, when did you come home? When did you come here? You know, and it's it's about that possessive about place that you either, you know, it's it's Norman McCaig's famous poem, you know, who owns this land? I who bought it or the person who is possessed by it, you mm -hmm. know. And for me, it's very much the latter. It's being possessed by it. I, I I could not imagine existing and thriving anywhere else further and i've been all over the world i mean I, and i enjoy traveling i love traveling you know and i hope to get back to that one day to travel in different places um but when i do i always want to come back here because this is a particular sense of landscape and a particular sense of of the environment the natural environment of here that is so special that it's just it is is it's either in your blood or else it's you, you you're quite a slow i've literally known people who have come here and never gone away again it's like it's you know the film local hero i know people <laughs> like that <laughs> the film just couldn't get away <laughs> Oh, well, I think that's a fantastic place to, to end uh, our conversation. I, although I was thinking when you were talking about the wind, when I uh, when I visited the Hebrides quite often, I remember some people telling me, I think it's an old joke, I, I probably am just too young to not know this, but they said, you know, one day that the wind stopped blowing and everyone fell over, oh, yeah. because they'd all been leaning into the wind. The whole oh, well, I, I can believe that. You can look <laughs> I remember coming out one time when my when my young oldest daughter was just a toddler and we went round the corridor. So I was running for the car and I was holding her hand and I heard this voice saying, Dad! And I looked down and she was horizontal. She was literally, she was like Superman flying in my hand because she was blown away by this thing. So the, the wind itself can be extremely, um, extremely testing. So, but it, it's wonderful to do that. So uh, what I should definitely say before we go is, so somebody did ask about this actually, is your book available on Kindle? No, it's not. It's on paperback only. It's on the, it's on the second printing though. So if you're looking oh. for it, you better go and get it. Super. Well, I mean, I, I can't, I'm going to hold it up again. I cannot recommend it enough for those of you who haven't already bought it. It is an absolutely fantastic read. It's got, you know, everything from science to culture to history. There's just, it's, a, it's a really beautiful and beautifully written. So thank you, Frank, so much for, for writing it so that we can all share your, your love of place, but also ruminate on the places that are special to us and what makes them so. Um, and before I go, I should also mention um, that if you enjoyed our, our uh, discussion today, we've got lots of other great events coming up. Um, next week, we'll be talking about another book called Beasts Before Us, who, uh, well, I might have written it, but you don't have to come to that event. But if anybody fancies hearing me, we're on also about... Also by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is on next Tuesday, the 28th. Oh, Angus is doing some. That's very nice of you. <laughs> and I'll be talking about fossils, particularly from Scotland, in that story. But on the 29th, we also have an introduction to the Rhiney Chert. 
uh, the hidden gem of Scottish geology with Sandy Hetherington, who is at the University of Edinburgh and is a, an absolutely fantastic speaker. He's actually the Pallas exceptional lecturer this year. So I highly recommend going to that to find about, about, about ancient plants and ecosystems. And on the 30th, uh, we're going to be looking at columnar basalt on Mull with James Westland. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, who doesn't like a good bit of columnar basalt? Yeah. Um, and again, one last book uh, related thing, and that is the launch of a geopoetics collection called Earthlines, which is gonna be on the 1st of October. So yeah, lots and lots of things to come to, and I hope I'll see many of our audience members there. Um, and I should just think, thank you, if you haven't noticed, lots and lots of people in the chat just saying thank you and that they really enjoyed your hearing from you and, and such. <laughs> pleasure. pleasure. Lovely to chat with you. Okay. Cheerio. Uh, lovely to speak to you. See you again. Okay.